We're glad you're here. If you're a guest or visiting, welcome. Welcome to the most beautiful sanctuary I know of. Ah. I'm telling you, God's showing off tonight. He is so, so good to us. Um, you know, it started, we started gathering like this during COVID, and which changed many of the things about how we do church. And one of the changes was we haven't been passing offering plates for obvious reasons during COVID. And since then, though, every time we've been together, we've had an offertory prayer. And what's been awakened in our hearts is that the corporate prayers of God's people can change the destinies of individuals, families, and nations. And we don't want to ever be together and fail to pray in a unified, intentional, purposeful way. So we're not going to pass an offering plate tonight. I know you're relieved. Not, not, not really. I know that's not true. I thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness in giving. Without you doing that, we could not do this. To, to present these concerts and worship services to our community week after week requires the faithfulness of God's people, and I thank you for that. Um, but for our offertory prayer tonight, I would ask you to pray with me for the peace of Jerusalem. If you haven't paid any attention to the news today, the Iranians have launched an attack, a multiple layer attack, apparently, first drones and they're anticipating missiles towards Israel. Um, it's personal to me. Uh, we were there yesterday. So yeah, if I looked jet lagged, you're very perceptive. I don't look a lot better than this when I'm not jet lagged, so don't, <laughs> don't tell me I look tired. That's just my style. But I want to pray for our friends in Israel. It's a very, very difficult time. I can tell you this, the one who watches over them never slumbers nor sleeps. But I have two great concerns, the people of the land and the position of our nation with regard to Israel. I think we're in one of the most dangerous places with regard to that, it, certainly in my lifetime. And I can promise you this, if we betray them and the commitments we've made to them, it's not whether the judgment of God will come, it's just how swiftly it will arrive. And so I want to ask you to stand with me for that prayer, no matter where you're watching or joining us for this service. If you're here on our campus or if you're elsewhere, if you're someplace else, put down your pizza. I believe prayer changes things. How about you? Amen. Absolutely it does. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you tonight for the freedom we have, the privilege of gathering in the name of Jesus to lift our hearts and voices and praise and worship to you. You said where two or three of us gather together that you would be in our midst and attentive. And, and Father, there's more than that here. And we pause tonight to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray you'll give wisdom to the leaders of that land that your angels would stand guard around them in a, in a far more intense way than any Iron Dome ever could. Give them the, the, the wisdom to make the decisions that need to be made in a timely fashion that will bring protection to the people of the land. I pray for those who have planned harm against them and plotted destruction, that their plans will be turned back on themselves. I thank you for that. I thank you for a revelation of yourself in that nation. It will change the course of human history. And Lord, we pray for our nation tonight, for those in authority over us, that they would humble themselves before you, that they might make decisions regarding the nation of Israel and regarding your word and your authority in this nation that would allow you to continue to bless us. Lord, we pray for them, irrespective of alliance or affiliation, Lord, that they would choose you. May they humble themselves. May they not make decisions that would bring your judgment upon us. Father, I thank you that you're involved in the earth, that you're preparing a people for yourself from every nation, race, language, and tribe. And I ask tonight that each of us would be faithful with the assignments you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You may have a seat. Good-looking group. <laughs> yeah, I meant you. Turn to the person on your right and said, he meant you. And turn to the one on the left and said, he's so far away he couldn't see you. Be nice. 
I hope you received an outline when you came in. If you did, most of the scriptures we will use are included there. If you did not, they'll put the scriptures on the screen. We've been working through a study under the general title of God is moving, and I believe that. I believe God is moving in the earth in an unprecedented way, certainly in an unprecedented way in my lifetime. There is such abundant evidence of that. There are expressions of ungodliness and wickedness and evil that are unparalleled. Every time we come up with a new technological breakthrough that can improve the quality of our lives, we pervert it and use it for, for evil and destruction. What I would encourage you to do is stay more aware of the benefits that come than focusing on the wickedness that people choose from those things. God is moving in the earth. In this session, I want to talk a little bit about what's going to be required of you and me. I feel like my assignment is to help the people of God that he's given me to serve to do the best I know to help you be prepared to cooperate with what God is doing so that you can flourish in the middle of what God is about. So in this session, I want to talk about overcoming fear because when God moves, change comes. And typically, one of our first responses to change of any sort is it's frightening. No matter whether we say that or not, we respond that way. Well, that's not how we do it. Never seen that before. That's not how me and my people are or whatever your response is. Not sure that's a good thing. Never seen that before. All of those can be descriptions of what God is doing. So we have to know what to do with the anxiety, the fear, the reluctance to go forward, that temptation to hold on to the familiar, the comfortable, the habit, the routine. We have all kinds of excuses. Oh, we've got a long list of those, and they're excuses for not going forward. It's not new. The Exodus generation, 400 years of Egyptian slavery, God supernaturally provides deliverance and the leadership they need. And a few days out of Egypt, their response is, we had a better menu when we were slaves. If we don't guard our hearts, we will allow fear and anxiety about uncertainty in what's in front of us to keep us from saying yes to the Lord and moving. I don't want that to happen. So I'd like to start with this notion of when God is moving. The questions are pretty simple. What should we anticipate when God is moving? You need some imagination for that. What will it look like? What can we learn from the biblical narratives about times when God moved? He moves in more than one way. He moves in different ways, different plans. How does God heal? In a myriad of ways. Sometimes Jesus spoke to sickness and disease. Sometimes he spat in the dust and made mud and smeared it on people's faces. I hope you're not called to that ministry. You'll have to learn to fight. You know, there's not a one-size-fits-all, and we can learn from the narrative of Scripture. What can we glean from the history of the church? We've got almost 2,000 years of experience of God's people standing in a variety of cultures and civilizations and different seasons and pressures. What can we learn from our own experience? You know what it is to be both godly and godly. Think about it. Recognize the differences. Know the motivations you had when you had momentum towards ungodliness. Understand the motivations you had when you were stuck in neutral and you were ambivalent and indifferent. Think about the motivations you had when you were pursuing the Lord. If you take your own experience, how would you evaluate your spiritual momentum right now? Don't answer that. Think about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you. You see, when God moves, you and I have to choose to move with him. We have to choose. The, the Hebrew slaves, their last night in Egypt was marked by the Passover. They're, they're preparing to celebrate Passover. I promise you, not all the Hebrew slaves put the blood of a lamb on their doorpost. It wasn't just a blanket invitation. If you're Hebrew, you're good. They got instructions from Moses. Every family was to take a lamb, and there were specifications for the lamb that would be selected and how to prepare it and what to do and what to do with the blood. You couldn't just do it any way you wanted to. You couldn't say, oh, Moses is always telling us what to do. I'm not a part of groupthink. I'm an individualist. Well, then you would have been an individualist with someone dead in your home. Not every Hebrew slave participated. Please don't imagine that because you attend a worship service, you sing along with Crowder, you can quote a Bible verse, that it means you'll say yes to the Lord. You have to choose every day. Well, pastor, I'm born again. I've been baptized. I'm happy for that. It's very important. If that's never happened, tonight would be your night. 
But if you've done that, tonight's the night to say yes to the Lord again. I'm not suggesting you earn your way to heaven. I'm suggesting to get off your good intentions and stop showing me your pedigree and show me the fruit of your life. The American church has been an inert church long enough. We have soaked in our ambivalence. And our fruit has, has been a, a lengthy nap. And God is giving us an opportunity. God is moving. There's some lessons we can glean from Israel. And I'm, I'll do this in some more detail in the next session. But for tonight, I want to read Zechariah chapter 12 in the first three verses. I think they are helpful for what we're watching on the screens and our televisions. I've been visiting Israel since I was a boy. My parents took my brother and I when we were young boys. And I, we've been in and out of the land of Israel from that day until this. So it, it's, it's not, actually, I'm so young, it's a very short sample. <laughs> ne nevertheless, it's my sample. And I've never seen Israel like I saw it this week. I've never seen the heaviness that I saw on the people. And I've been there in some pretty difficult times. I've been there when wars were breaking out. I've been there during the Intifada. But it was different this week. There's an openness to the, to the Lord I've never seen, but there's a heaviness on the people I've never seen. And Zechariah chapter 12, I think is appropriate. This is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord who stretches out the heavens and who lays the foundation of the earth and who forms the spirit of man within him declares. Let's pause there just a moment. That first verse is important. It says, this is the word of the Lord concerning Israel. And then he makes three statements that I would submit to you from my vantage point. He, God is presenting his credentials for having the authority and power to declare what he's about to declare. So if you want to know if, if God has the juice if he's got the ability to follow up, this is how he introduces himself. This is his curriculum vitae. He said, I'm the Lord who stretched out the heavens, and I'm the Lord who laid the foundations of the earth, and I'm the Lord who forms the spirit of man within him. Now, I grew up in a barn in Tennessee, so help me, let me interpret. He said, I made the heavens, and I made the earth, and I made you. Now, let me tell you what I'm going to do. With that authority, let's listen to what he says is coming to Israel. He said, I'm going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. On that day, when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I'll make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. And all who try to move it will injure themselves. He made five statements. I'll, I'll tag them for you just real quickly. It's a declaration of intent. If you prefer, and I think more accurately, it's an expression of God's sovereignty. He said, I'm going to do this, and I don't care what the United Nations think. I don't care what the Secretary of State of the United States thinks. I don't care what the Security Council votes on. This is what I will do. We should pay attention. I'm not always the brightest bulb in the box, but I have discovered it is better to cooperate with God. And on this topic, I think that is especially true. He said these five things. I'll make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. It's the imagery of somebody that's had too much to drink or at the very least has lost their balance. If you're inebriated or for some reason you've lost your balance, you're not making great quality of life decisions. You're not charting a steady course. You'll do destructive things. You can't do simple things. And he said, that's the, the impact I will cause Jerusalem to have. They'll do things that are not in their best interest. They will bring destruction to them. And then he said, secondly, Judah and Jerusalem will be besieged. In spite of that, they're going to be encircled by their enemies. That's true. Literally, if you look at a map, the nations surrounding Israel are all united in their intent to bring destruction. But it isn't just that um, those immediate surrounding nations. Israel has been isolated in the global community in a way that's unprecedented since the modern state of Israel was born. They were forced last week by our nation, by our nation, to withdraw from Gaza. 
Hundreds and hundreds of Israelis were brutally murdered on October the 7th in a terrorist attack by Hamas. I watched the videos. It, was, it wasn't human what was done to them. They took hostages back to Gaza, and not just the Hamas terrorists in their wannabe uniforms. The citizens of Gaza poured through the breaches and the fences. I saw it dragging women by their hair into the back of pickup trucks, the citizens taking them back to Gaza. And we forced the Israelis to withdraw, and the hostages were not released. Listen to what God said. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem, and on that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock, for all the nations. The nations will gather against her, but it will not change God's purpose. The one who formed the heavens and the one who formed the earth and the one who made you is standing guard over that city. And then he said, all who try to move it will injure themselves. The English is a little more sedate than the Hebrew. The Hebrew says, all who try to move Jerusalem will rupture themselves. A rupture may not be fatal, but if you've got one, the days of heavy lifting are over. And I believe what God said has been supported by history. The nations that picked up Jerusalem to impose a solution upon them in opposition to God's purposes forfeited their authority in the world stage. And I think our nation stands at the precipice of that tonight. It's worth your prayer. If you don't agree with me, ask the Lord to give you a revelation. I'm not asking you to agree with me. Get your Bible out. But don't sit in ignorance and say, I don't believe that. That's not a helpful proposition. At least allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God to direct you. Don't stay ambivalent. Don't stay neutral. Don't allow yourself to be distracted by whatever you choose for distractions. Don't shop your way into a lack of awareness. Don't just chase your hobby. Don't just say it's for your family. Stop and engage in the purposes of God and the earth. God is moving. It was a hassle to prepare a Passover lamb. Your neighbors would make fun of you when you started smearing blood on the door of your home. You'd have friends in your peer group that weren't participating. What are they going to say about us? And what are we going to say to them? The same is true today. Decide where you intend to be. God is moving in the earth. I want to move with him. I want to raise my hand. Yes, I have been a Christ follower. Yes, I have been in ministry. I can point at a lot of things not relevant. What am I doing tonight? Where is my heart invested? What am I leaning towards? It's important. It's important. We'll talk more about that. There's some lessons from Gideon. That's really where we started this little series. Gideon is one of the judges in the Hebrew Bible, not somebody who sat on a, a bench in a courtroom, but a leader of God's people. Twelve tribes, no central government, no capital city. When there's a challenge, God is over their overseer. It's a theocracy. God is leading the tribes of Israel for 400 years. Arguably the most fruitful season they knew, but when there was a, a, a common threat, God would raise up a leader. Samson was a judge. Deborah was a judge. Gideon was a judge. We began this last weekend, but in Gideon's chap, Gideon chap, Judges chapter 6, I'm sorry. I'm new to this job. It's Judges chapter 6. Do you remember the narrative with Gideon? Do you remember the story? Well, Gideon has taken the, the group that God selected. He's down to 300 men, and he, says he took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him because he was afraid of his family and the men of the town. He did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning when the men of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished and the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. And they asked each other who did this. And they carefully investigated, and they were told, Gideon, he did it. 
And the, man of the, the men of the town demanded of Gideon's father, bring out your son. He must die because he's broken down Baal's altar and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. God willing, I'm going to give you the three O's of participating when God's moving. I needed three something. The O's will work. Just bear with me. And it's not, oh my, oh me, and oh my goodness. Remember Gideon now. Israel has been handed over to their enemies by God. Did you know God will do that? If you choose not to serve him, you shouldn't think you stand under his protection. If you won't honor God in your life, in every aspect of your life, why do you imagine God should provide protection for you in every aspect of your life? Do we imagine we can sit in church and sing along and nod appropriately and then go live like the devil and live with the protection of God? Folks, it's a false gospel. It's deception. If we're more invested in the things that we want than the things that God wants, you have to understand we walk out from under his protection. Please don't do that. Please don't. The people cried out to God in humble repentance, and God recruited Gideon. He didn't recruit a warrior. He didn't recruit a soldier. He has no history of military leadership. There's nothing in Gideon's resume that suggests he would be a great leader except God recruited him. And then God directs Gideon to winnow down his force of available fighting men to 300 people that are selected. Doesn't sound like a big deal, except the adversary has tens of thousands. And God keeps saying to Gideon, your force is too large. Until he's down to facing an enemy of tens of thousands with 300 men. So here's the first O. We've got to learn to overcome fear. I read you a bit of Gideon's narrative. It says God told him to tear down the, the altars in his town, in the place where he lived. And Gideon said he would do it, but Gideon did it at night. And the book of Judges says that was because he was afraid. We're not going to be able to pursue God unless we acknowledge the places we're afraid. We have a whole menu. We have a whole litany of language that excuses the fact that we're afraid. Well, I don't believe that. Or God just hasn't made that real to me. Or that's not a burden I carry. Or I don't have children in that school. Or I don't work in that whatever. It's mostly language for why we don't have to respond because we're afraid. If we weren't afraid, we would have a voice and a willingness to express it and a willingness to stand. So what I would submit to you is if we're going to move with God, we're going to have to learn to overcome our fear. Gideon worked at night. He was rightfully afraid, and that's important to note. His fear was not based on something mythical. It wasn't some psychological quirk within him. Because when he had finished the assignment, they wanted to kill whoever was responsible for what Gideon had done in obedience to God. Are you willing to move with the Lord if it puts you on the wrong side of an angry mob? It's a very important question. Because we have been engaged in an expression of Christianity now for several decades in this nation that said our primary goal is to go along and get along, to be bridge builders, to be peace. We want the wicked and the immoral and the ungodly to know how much God loves them. And it's true, he does. But we've, we've presented that message with such persistence in such an articulate way that the people of God have been lulled into believing it's not necessary for them to be godly. Because after all, God loves the wicked and the immoral and the brazen and the rebellious. So why should we be anything other than that? Folks, we got to wake up. Gideon was willing to stand on the wrong side of this. He did the right thing, fully aware of the threat. He was prudent, but he wasn't brash. We don't need to be arrogant. We don't need to be condescending. We don't have to be violent. But in order to move, Gideon had to overcome his fear, his fear of personal harm, the fear of the consequences for his family. Please do not hide behind your family as an excuse for condoning ungodliness. You're not protecting them. You're making them vulnerable. It may not seem apparent in the moment, 
But if you condone wickedness, imagining that you're protecting your family, providing for them a better future, whatever your rationale is, it's wrong. Gideon had to overcome his fear of failure. There's absolutely no reason in the narrative or from the circumstances described for Gideon to have believed that when he did that, it would bring significant change to his community or to his nation. And in fact, he was right because the next morning they wanted to murder whoever did it and they wanted to replace the, the idols that he had destroyed. So don't think that you'd have the courage if you knew that your action would bring about sweeping change. The question is, will I have the courage to do what's right, even if I think it simply puts me in harm's way and it may not have an impact? You see, the enemy will silence you with the lie that your decision to honor God doesn't make a difference. His decision to stand in opposition to God cost him his place in heaven. I promise you a decision to honor God is more powerful. We don't know what outcome God will choose. We have to choose to honor the Lord when it seems like nobody's watching. We have to stand up for what we know to be right when it seems like there will be no applause. Most people would do it if there was going to be great applause and you knew the outcome. The question is, will you have the, the courage to overcome when the fear is palpable? Psalm 56 and verse 3 says, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. Please understand the people of God throughout the narrative of Scripture, and I would add throughout the history of the church, have been willing to move forward in obedience even when they're afraid. It isn't the absence of fear that lets us choose to serve the Lord. Trust is the antidote to fear. The objective of fear in your life is to paralyze to render you inactive. If fear can just immobilize you, it's throughout, throughout creation, they talk about the fight or the flight syndrome. When you're, when you're frightened, you stop. And there's a whole host of evaluations that begin, some beyond the conscious level, whether you're trying to decide whether it's more prudent to fight or to run. But what fear does at that moment of recognition is it paralyzes you. you. We've talked about a deer caught in the headlights. If you're from the city, ask some country person to explain that to you. <laughs> well, fear's intent in your life is to paralyze you. You can do courageous things while you're battling fear. If your trust in the Lord is greater than your fear and anxiety. The evidence of overcoming fear in your life is not another Bible study. The evidence of your overcoming fear is activity in serving the Lord. If you're neutral, if you're silent, if you're indifferent, if you're immobile, fear has occupied a place that isn't helpful. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 8. One of the assignments I have suggested that we pick up as a part of our preparation for what's ahead of us is memorizing some scripture. I'm not bringing you a verse every week. I don't think we'd keep up. But from time to time, I would like to bring you one. I brought you one tonight. And when I bring you the memory verses, I want to give you a proclamation, which is a declaration of what that verse says and its application for your life. Let me read the verse first. It's Deuteronomy 31 and verse 8. And yes, I'm asking you to commit this to memory. You're not too old. You're not too young. You're not too busy. You're not too clever. Put the Word of God in your heart. There are times in front of us when you will be very, very grateful you have taken the time and made the effort to put the Word of God within you. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you, and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. There's a principle of biblical interpretation I've shared with you before. If the Bible tells you what to do when your ox gores your neighbor, it's because somebody's ox gored their neighbor. If the Bible says do not be afraid and do not be discouraged, you can be certain that the audience addressed is two things, frightened and discouraged. So let's make that a proclamation over our own lives. If you've got notes, you can read it with me. 
If you don't, they'll put it on the screens. Yes, they will. Can we say it together? You're outdoors. Can you use your outdoor voice? All right, together. The Lord himself goes before me. He is with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. I am not afraid. I am not discouraged. Amen. I said three O's. I got 10 minutes, no problem. We need, if we're going to go with God when God is moving, we need to understand we are dependent upon outcomes beyond ourselves. We're going to have to have outcomes that are beyond ourselves. You're going to have to overcome fear because you're going to recognize you need an outcome you can't deliver. If you can deliver it, you don't need God. If your response to whatever is in front of you is, I've got this, you're not cooperating with the Lord enough. God invites you to places where you understand you are dependent upon him. Outcomes beyond ourselves. Often we're afraid to consider the reality of our circumstances. I've come to this conclusion that oftentimes we hide. We pretend not to notice. We remain silent. We don't want to make the effort to be informed. Because if we're informed, we might have to do something. And we prefer ignorance to preparation far too often. We're afraid to consider the reality of our circumstances because we know the implications that if we actually acknowledge what is going on or what has gone on or what we failed to do or when we failed to speak up, then we're forced to face our own inadequacies. We might have to repent. We might have to humble ourselves. There might be a course correction, and, and we don't really want to change courses. Or there's uncertainty. Maybe it's, there's just a lack of confidence in God. So we don't want to think about what's happening. We want to sit on the deck of the Titanic and play shuffleboard. What crashing noise? I don't like the hors d'oeuvres, do you? I, I have a bit of that sense amongst us that we don't really want to look at the uncomfortable things that are happening and have dialogue about it because we would like to pretend we didn't hear the noise and we don't see it because we would prefer to maintain momentum in the direction we're going. God is moving. The safest place, the most fruitful place, the greatest opportunities are moving with God. I promise. Outcomes beyond ourselves. We'll have to be willing to walk towards God-directed outcomes. Gideon did. Outcomes that are beyond not only ourselves, they're beyond our strength, they're beyond our ability, they're beyond our experience. We've never seen that before. Our track record doesn't suggest it could happen. It seems improbable. There's probably not a big choir of people going, oh, absolutely, that makes sense to me. You need godly friends. You shouldn't expect the ungodly to encourage you to be godly. If you spend your discretionary time with people who don't have momentum towards God, guess what you will cultivate? It's important. Judges chapter 7, Gideon is winnowed down the, from thousands of people who volunteered. He's down to 300 men. God selected, but 300 men. The enemy's numbered by the tens of thousands. Gideon is not only outmatched by military strength, he's so totally outnumbered, it's a ludicrous proposition to begin a conflict. And he attacks. He takes his 300 men. He splits them into groups of 100. He gives them some very critical military instruction. It's in your notes. It's Judges 7. Gideon and the 100 men with him. There's two other companies of 100. Reach the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they changed the guard. And they blew their trumpets, and they broke the jars that were in their hands. That's their strategy. Toot your horn and crack your pot. Yeah. God said, I want to use you to rout an enemy that has been plaguing your people for years. And here's the strategy. Just get a few men. And at the most critical point, tell them all you're there and break a pot. Oh, sure. Do you think Gideon talked to the Lord about that at all? I promise. I promise. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars. They grasped the torches in their left hands, holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow, and they shouted, oh, good, this is going to make all the difference. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other 
with their swords, and the army fled. Gideon and 300 men with a horn and a pot routed an army of tens of thousands because God directed the outcome. I want to ask you to begin to say to the Lord, God, I want you to direct the outcome of my life. Now, in order to say that with any credibility, you'll have to be able to say, God, I don't want to direct the outcome. I want to follow you. If you're moving, I want to move with you. If you're doing something, I want to participate so that my goal isn't to maintain the status quo, to do what I've always done, to be where I'm always supposed to be on Sunday morning at whatever hour, but the rest of the time is mine. God, I want to move with you. Outcomes beyond ourselves require a second thing. It's required to fulfill our assignment. Without God's help, we can't do it, folks. If you're not engaged in the pursuit of an outcome that you can't fulfill, you shouldn't imagine you're trying to complete God's assignment for your life. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that someone has told you that if you're born again and you've said the sinner's prayer, you don't really need to think about God anymore. I'm not diminishing the significance of that. I believe in the new birth. I believe in the absolute necessity of conversion, initiation. But I assure you, it's a false gospel that says there's nothing beyond that. That is the beginning point. It's as misleading as saying that the point of conception is to give birth. That after you've given birth, there's nothing beyond that. Life is finished, just write it out. We all understand the promise of a child is the hope of a future. And the promise of your new birth is the hope of a life given to the Lord. We want to live for outcomes that require God's help to fulfill our assignment. Hebrews 11 describes a whole menu of these people. And as the chapter concludes, it says, Through faith they conquered kingdoms. They administered justice. They gained what was promised. They shut the mouths of lions. They quenched the fury of the flames. They escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength. That's where I'd like to focus our attention. Participating with God means our strength is not enough. That we acknowledge in the light of the circumstance, I'm weak. In light of the assignment, I can't do it. And we've usually got a track record that says we can't do it. And God says, nevertheless, we can. We have not been prepared to depend upon God. It's a change we have to make. We've been dependent upon the government, our education, the fairness of the systems we were in, whatever. But we have not been trained to depend upon God. He is preparing us. It is a biblical concept. Look in Luke 23. This is Jesus on the cross. His physical strength is just about done. And it says, he called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he took his last breath. Jesus was dependent upon the Father to complete his assignment. Newsflash, so are we. If you don't imagine that you're dependent upon God in order to finish the race to which you were called, you've been asleep. There's a third component if our outcomes are going to be beyond ourselves, and that's to acknowledge his power is at work within us. Not just to forgive us, not just to help us get our way, not just to help us get our children into the school we want them to attend, not just to change the label in the clothing we wear. I'm not opposed to any of those things, but I don't believe the one who formed the heavens, the one who established the foundation of the earth, and the one who created you and me stays up at night figuring out how to improve the label in my clothing. Agreed? Ephesians 3 and verse 20. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. That's written to a church. Jesus made a statement on the cross. I can read you passage after passage from the Hebrew Bible, but I want you to understand the church has a similar acknowledgement that the same power that brought Jesus out of the grave is at work within us. To do more than we could ask or imagine. It's beyond us. 
We've been coached to go sit in church and be polite, fool the pastor for a little bit of time, and then get on with yourself. I'm inviting you into the kingdom of an almighty God to take your place in our generation so that when those people look back upon this season in the history of the church, they will say that generation stood in the authority of Jesus' name. When the enemy came in like a flood, they said, God, use me to raise up a standard against it. Take your hands off of our children. Get out of our homes. Stop dictating ungodliness and immorality. Folks, it's up to us to say, in the name of Jesus, let the truth be told. Are you willing? Are you willing? I brought you a prayer. I brought you a prayer. If you'll stand with me. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And then if you're here to be baptized tonight, and there's several dozen of you, I'm going to invite you to start to make your way to the pool after we pray. And then Crowder is coming back in just a minute, and we're going to worship the Lord. I know many of you came because you enjoy his music, but I want to ask you to do more than that. I want to ask you to imagine that he's going to invite us into the presence of God. I'm grateful for his talent and his willingness to yield it to the Lord and the, the, the band with, with him that will help us with that. But please don't just sit and be entertained. As he ministers to you, you minister to the Lord. God is the healer of our bodies. He delivers us from the sins that beset us. He can change your heart. A businessman in Jerusalem this week told me this story. A 26-year-old woman called him and told him a bit of her story. She'd had a very difficult life, far from God. And she came to the end of herself. She's Jewish. And she said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem and put a prayer in the wall, in the western wall, the wailing wall. And she said she wrote on a little piece of paper. If you've ever been there, you see them all stuffed in the wall and blowing around in the wind. But she wrote on the prayer, Jesus, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. That's not a prayer often prayed there. She said, I put the prayer in the wall and I turned around to walk away. And she said, as I walked through the streets of the old city, somehow I knew Jesus was real. And she said, I'm different. And she called my friend. She said, somebody gave me your name and said that you helped people like me. And he was going to connect her with some believers. But I'm telling you, God is moving in the earth. And you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. So I want to invite you to say this prayer with me, not as some rote recitation to end the service and get on with it, but as a conscious yielding to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, we cry out to you for help. You are well able to deliver your people from every oppression. Forgive us of our stubborn pride and our refusal to cooperate with you. We acknowledge our own sin, our rebellion, and desire to be independent. Look now upon us with mercy. Raise up men and women to speak the truth so that our children may live with your blessings. Grant us understanding hearts and the courage to cooperate with what you're doing in the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand.